In honor of the Week of Solidarity with Haiti, we would like to share an interview conducted in September of this year by our very own Lisa Hoffman. Speaking with Pierre Labossiere, a co-founder of the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund, HERF for short, and the Haiti Action Committee. East Bay Sanctuary Covenant has partnered with HERF since 1991 to support grassroots development and human rights in Haiti. In this special two-part series, you'll hear about the history of EBSC's solidarity with the Haitian people, updates about what's recently gone down in Haiti, and some of Pierre's thoughts on TPS, BLM, COVID, and more. We opted to conduct the interview in a park due to the pandemic, so you might hear children playing and dogs barking in the background. Lisa is also a bit more difficult to hear because Pierre was the only one connected to a microphone, so to help with that, we've included a full transcript if you have trouble hearing or would just like to follow along. A content warning, at times Pierre and Lisa discuss deeply unsettling violence in some detail, so please take the necessary precautions to care for your mental and emotional health. And with that, here's part one. I've been affiliated with East Bay Sanctuary Covenant since I would say the early 90s, to be more specific, 1991, as a result of the coup d'etat in Haiti, we started working more closely together, especially in terms of Haitian refugees who needed assistance, who were filing for political asylum, and who needed to, who were in the Bay Area and who needed assistance. So our affiliation grew from that day on, and it's going on until today. So many different questions that come up for me, but um, <laughs> when was the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund established? And tell us about the, the mission of the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund. During the first coup d'etat, 1991 to 1994, we had a number of refugee families um, who had resettled in the Bay Area, and so they needed assistance. And in Haiti proper, a number of people were being killed by the forces of the coup, by the right-wing um, death squads. So we were alerted to this situation. And people were saying, look, can you help with a few dollars, whatever. It will do wonders to help somebody whose home was burned down, to help someone who's trying to take, to leave the area where the death squads were looking for them. The name Haiti Emergency Relief Fund came on during the second coup against President Aristide um, because we, we wanted to show there were other people who joined the original committee and we wanted also to show that there is an emergency in Haiti. So instead of keeping Haiti Education Project, because here we are, a coup, people are dying, but 10,000 people killed. A massive disruption in Haiti. We had to, um, you know, give it a name that would be broader, that would describe the current situation. And that, that came on in 2004. We added a number of other people to the committee. Um, Sister Maureen, of course, Marilyn Langloy, Robert Wolf, the at attorney Walter Riley. And now the committee has expanded to include two other people, Seth Dunley and Nia Imara. So tell us about some of the early uh, projects that uh, you were supporting in Haiti. Yes, some of the early projects. I remember there was a law school because Haiti needed to be a, a country of laws, a state of laws, where the law was um, conflicts could be resolved legally. And, um, and the people needed legal representation. Without any funding, they would have to close the schools. So we discussed it in the committee and said, oh no, this is not going to happen. So we are going to do what we could, not only try to raise some money for them, but also create contacts among the various lawyers, the people we knew. And we did, we connected them, and eventually now this has led to the continuation of Hastings to Haiti project. The Law School of Hastings connected with the Law School of Jeremy. We provided support also to some former cooperatives in buying uh, pumps so that they could pump water to irrigate their fields. And uh, we also advocated, told people what was happening in Haiti, gave interviews, 
had um, people come from Haiti to give testimony as to what the situation was in the rebuilding efforts, but also what had happened to people. Uh, locally, at the time, even though the coup was over, but a number of the refugees uh, had applied for political asylum and their cases were coming up. So they had to, we had to work with them along those lines and to advocate for their rights and help them prepare them. But that was mostly the EBSC staff that did a lot of this work. My work was to translate as much as I could for the refugees. So it's a variety of work and that's what I appreciate with EBSC. Not only did EBSC look at the immediate needs of the people and also help them to connect with com the broader community locally so they could, uh, uh, people would know what's going on and they could get support. But also EBSC saw it in bigger terms that it's okay to do that to respond to immediate needs but also until and unless we address the root causes of um, the, the push factors force migration, then, you know, it's not going to be resolved. Even though it may take longer, but people needed to be aware that U.S. foreign policy had to be addressed because this is what was at the root of this forced migration of people from Haiti, from El Salvador, Nicaragua, you name it, throughout the Americas and throughout the world in many places, you know, not just the U.S. foreign policy, but other countries as well, foreign powers who had policies that were driving people to flee their homeland, and that had to be addressed. In a sense, uh, we had to look at it in bigger terms against militarism, you know, to beat our swords into plowshares. That was the message that had to be out there to everyone. Yes. <laughs> um, so fast forwarding a little bit to now, um, tell us a little bit about what's been happening in Haiti over the last year since we last heard from you at last year's annual dinner. Yes. It's uh, what's been going on in Haiti for the past year. It's been in a sense more of the same mass killings, massacres of the people. It reminds me in so many ways of what was going on in El Salvador, in uh, Guatemala. It's a war against the people. They call it low intensity warfare. Well, when we speak to the survivors, when I hear them uh, on the radio, Radio Simon, which is youth radio, the radio out of the, um, out of the Aristide Foundation in Haiti, where the victims are describing what they are going through, it, there is nothing low intensity about it. Their homes, for example, uh, last Wednesday, there was another mass killings taking place in the community of Bel Air over the weekend. And it's been going on now for the past two weeks. And what's so sad about it is that the so-called president of Haiti, Jovenel Moïse, his palace is about, is within earshot of Bel Air. It's right in downtown Port-au-Prince. Um, and that's where they have all the militarized police, all of those heavily armed units of the police, yet people are being attacked by right-wing death squads, and people are calling on the police to help, but the police is standing by, not doing anything, and watching these people's homes being burned. In many instances, it was reported on the radio that some people have been burned alive in their homes. This is what's happening. We are talking the month of September the month of July, the month of August. It got so to a point where the bishop, the one bishop, Bishop Pierre-André Dumas, actually has come out and has um, called on to stop the killing. And he, he quoted Monsignor Romero, Archbishop, Archbishop Bishop Romero, and said, enough of those killings. And so a number of people, uh, about two weeks ago, the head of the Haitian Bar Association, who said, I'm sorry, before I get ahead of myself, the U.S. government, the State Department, is saying elections, elections, elections. The people of Haiti are saying, no, the country is going through too much. We have a so-called president who is a criminal. He's a corrupt individual, according to uh, various legal entities in Haiti. There is an indictment against him, and there is no way we can go to elections with this man. Too many people are being killed. 
those right-wing death squads have been clearly shown to be associated with him and with people very highly placed in his government. Those killings have been going on for years now. And to this day, these people who are in you know, positions of authority still remain in their post. There is no way we can go to, to an election with someone like that. Well, the head of the Bo Association, after he gave those interviews, he went home. He was assassinated as he was coming into his house. Just a week ago, there was a funeral for him, and the, a number of attorneys wanted to lay a wreath at the spot where he was killed. Well, the Haitian police came in, heavily armed, and lobbed tear gas to disperse the attorneys. The attorneys. I mean, you see them with their robe and peacefully marching with the wreath. And so they, they were dispersed by the police brutally. And uh, so this is the state of degeneration. This is how the situation has degenerated to a point where there is no pretense of democracy. And that's why the bishop came out and spoke about it, spoke against it. Students are being brutalized, mass killings are taking place, and yet the U.S. State Department is saying, well, unless you go to elections with this president, then people who stand in the of these elections, they, they will face consequences. Immediately, many Haitians and some in the media have said, well, is that a, a threat? Is this the same threat that the head of the Bar Association had received? Because he was threatened after having said that, and yet he, he was killed. So many of us are asking, us, are asking the questions very loudly, many in Haiti and also outside of Haiti. So it's a very dire situation. We also had uh, the economic situation in Haiti is very, very dire. Uh, corruption is at an all-time high. Never, we've never seen this kind of, this level of corruption um, so blatantly taking place and with uh, the kind of impunity where people who are engaged in the corruption, even though they are, the scandal is out there, yet they, they walk the streets, they have their jobs, they have their positions high in the government um, apparatus, and there is no um, sanction taking place against these people. So it's as if it's the mafia. It sounds like what we're on the path to sometimes. <laughs> I mean, for real, like it's uh, everything you're describing. I mean, we're not there yet, but it, it's eerie. That's why many Haitians are saying to people in the U.S., be careful, and they quote Jesus, what is done, what you do to the least among thee, that's what you do to me. So in a sense, what people are saying, don't think that this may not, Haiti is like a laboratory where it's done on a small scale, they measure to see how people will respond, and then this can happen in the U.S. as well. And that's why I'm so happy that to see how the American public has been responding with outrage and saying, no, we are not going to tolerate any of this. So many different questions, but um, what, are, what are some of your thoughts on... Um the Black Lives Matter movement, and especially on what it means for refugees and immigrants of color, and especially black refugees and black immigrants. I'm so, I'm very happy to see the Black Lives Matter movement taking place. Really shows what uh, technology can do with when everybody has a cell phone and how they can videotape things that before used to happen, but it was like, you can't prove it. In Haiti as well, we get, I received so many videos of atrocities being committed by the police and the right-wing death squads. I don't send them out because people in their grief will take a photo of a loved one with a bullet in, in their head, in his or her head, uh, of babies being murdered by the right, right wing death squads, of people's homes being completely uh, set on fire while they are doing it. These are very graphic. People take those to send to the outside world to show 
the world outside what, what they are going through, what's going on. And so the same thing happens in the U.S. with people filming what's going on. The best way I can tell you about the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement, as we know, it, it transcended all borders. You know, people responded to seeing the video of George Floyd with outrage. And this hit Haiti also, Haiti saw that. And the people of Haiti responded with outrage as well. And they said, this is similar to what we are, what's going on in Haiti. And they staged demonstrations in support, in solidarity with George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement here. And various representatives of peasant organizations actually sent a note of solidarity to the, to the people of the U.S. and to the black community in particular, saying, we too, and they cited some of, their, some of the names of the victims in Haiti, and said, we too are going through the same thing, so we feel what you are feeling. We need to be in solidarity with each other so that together we can do away with racism, injustice, and the spirit of militarism. This, this belief in violence, uh, this belief that other people are not, are not worth living, that their lives do not matter. We need a worldwide movement against it. So it was a beautiful statement that we circulated to, to various people. We translated it into English and circulated it. So I think that the Black Lives Matter movement has very much awakened and has created a platform where people of different ethnicities can come together and say, I feel it, and as a human being, I cannot allow for this to take place to another human being. I think when we get to that level, we will see beautiful changes in the world. It's not going to be easy, but we are on the way of making those changes. Yeah, it, you know, sometimes I wonder, like, when you see this evidence of these atrocities, um, or like for example, when we saw children in cages. Yes. And um, how how could people cope with that? And one of the answers that somebody shared with me was that oh, it's because they don't see those children as human. Exactly. And you know, I think of. of Haiti and U.S. involvement in Haiti for hundreds of years that have, when you talk about root causes, it goes back a really long way. Yes. Um, of, of dehumanization and colonization. Exactly. Last year, just about a year ago, I translated a statement from two members of the Haitian ruling elite. Those statements were made in November of 2016, right after the stolen election that made Jovenel Moïse president. These were elections conducted by the UN and the US. So I call it the United Nations, United States occupation. This member of the elite was speaking in support of Jovenel Moïse, and he said anybody who is in the way or objects to him being the president will die. He said it on TV, he made a video, and it was reported in various newspapers. This was followed a few days later by another person who didn't identify himself. It was a very violent, vile, racist statement urging war against the, the Africans, as he referred to black people in Haiti the majority population, and he said, you will be killed. And he described almost to, a, in, to, the, to, the, to the smallest detail what we've been seeing since that time. And he referenced the, the previous statement by this fellow, and he said, what he said is nothing compared to what I'm saying now. I'm laying it out for you. We have the money, we have the guns, and we will kill you all. And I, I said, will anybody believe me? But now, looking at everything that has been going on, I said, my God, this guy was describing, he was putting out a plan that they are implementing. And so it's, it's phenomenal, this statement. 
And so this is just to say to you that, unfortunately, in this world, when we look at Germany, very enlightened country back in the 30s, and to see how could a Hitler arise and turn and, and be, do this Holocaust against the Jews and against so many others, you know, and, um, but particularly the Jewish community. So it, it was, um, and only when we know and we feel for each other, so that at the first sign of any atrocity against a member of the human race, against another human being, we need to rise up all together and say, you touch this one, you touch all of us. And we put a stop to it right then and there. Otherwise, if we make excuses or we allow this to happen, it's going to be a repeat of this ugly reality that, that the world has had enough of. I guess, is there anything else that you would want to share about um, both what uh, the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund and the Haiti Action Committee are doing um, either in Haiti or here in the U.S. in order to address this um, multi-layered um, problem and propose actual solutions that support real people to create their own solutions? What I would like to propose, what we, Haiti Action Committee, Haiti Emergency Relief Fund propose, number one is to, for people to be aware, for people to learn, uh, to, to get to know what the situation in Haiti is. And to put it in, the, in a nutshell, the, it's U.S. foreign policy. The same foreign policy that impacts so negatively the people of Central and South America is the same policy that's impacting the people of Haiti. And so they exploit others. And when people stand up and say, no, we need higher wages, we need to have decent living conditions, we need our tax money to be invested in healthcare, in our education, they send death squads to kill them. And the death squads are organized by the government. And you have the security forces that, um, that act as the death squads of the government. And they get support from the US. They receive military training, as in School of the Americas. They receive all kinds of military hardware, all kinds of military equipment. That is the foreign policy that needs to change. So that's number one. Number two is to support all of those communities that are in their homeland, farmer cooperatives, women's cooperatives, um, people building institutions such as the teaching hospital of the University of the Aristide Foundation. And when families who are forced to flee their homeland come to the US, they need more voices to advocate for them. They need people to, to stand up and say, we'll fight for you. We will represent you. We need to get more and more attorneys, people in the legal profession, to be aware, to be touched by those stories so that they can stand up and fight, as many are doing. But the numbers need to be bigger, you see, to, to help support that. I feel that there is a need for other voices, other minds to come together and propose other solutions which, which we are really in, in great need of. The more people get in, involved and the more people collectively we can come up with solutions so that we can do away with this system, this odious system that creates so much suffering throughout the world and right here in our communities as well. We could probably talk for hours, but um, so what do you want the broader EBSC community to know right now? Just to give you an example, I was in Haiti and someone uh, mentioned my name. And the person said, wait a minute, that's Pierre Laboussière? I said, yeah. He said, you don't know me, but you saved my life. I said, how? 
And I said, no, no, not me. Then he described to me what had happened. That was during the coup. And I had received a phone call. And some people needed some funding so they could save themselves. And the very little that we had from the committee, we sent it. And I never thought about it. So I said, no, it's not me. And I told him about EBSC, I told him about the Haiti Action Committee, about this beautiful community here, because the money is not, it's money from the community. Thanks to EBSC, which is the fiscal sponsor of the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund, we are now helping the Aristide Foundation for Democracy and the University of the Aristide Foundation. Number one, rebuild the university. And number two, we are helping in their building a teaching hospital. This teaching hospital is so needed by the people of Haiti, where women are, pregnant women are dying because of lack of care. They will go to the general hospital where millions of dollars have been poured in it, but people have stolen the money. When I say people, the government, and also some of those big NGOs, they have stolen the money. And so you have women laying on the bare floor of the maternity wards, not even a bed there for them. But with this institution being built, young people are studying the healthcare professions, but they are not studying it with a way, as a way to make money, to become rich off the misery of others. They are studying it to be of service to their communities. And so EBS is very involved, has been very involved in schools, in other grassroots institutions, in helping farmer cooperatives, women farmers, other people in so many things that, um, and that's, that has helped people stay alive. And it's also the rebuilding of Haiti, slowly being built brick by brick by brick. One human being, one family, one community, all together they are rebuilding Haiti. And EBS is a big partner in this rebuilding process. So um, keep your commitment, the work that you do, EBSC and the broader community. It's just immense, immense. Thanks for tuning into the first half of our two-part series all about Haiti. Make sure you follow us to catch the release of the second episode coming soon. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at East Bay Sanctuary and on Twitter at eBay Sanctuary or on our website at eastbaysanctuary.org. You can learn more about Haiti by going to the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund website at haitiemergencyrelief.org or the Haiti Action Committee website at haitisolidarity.net. You can also follow them on Facebook and on Twitter at Haiti Action One. Thank you to Lisa Hoffman and Pierre Labossier for sharing their conversation with us. This episode was edited by Noreen Ortiz Pond. Music used for this episode was written by Kevin McLeod, provided by Incompetech.com. Until next time, we hope you protect, advocate, and transform.